you can't write a film like this or make a film like this without rummaging in your own basement. That sounds. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> Let's say rummaging in your own attic. <laughs> Good God almighty. You know, they put themselves in danger, girls like that. I need to lie down. What are you doing? It's okay, hey, you're safe. What are you doing? Hey, I said, what are you doing? Hi, I'm Kate Arthur. Hi, I'm Matt Donnelly. We're here with Emerald Fennell and Carrie Mulligan to talk about Promising Young Woman. Emerald, what's the origin story of this movie? When did you begin writing it and what was it inspired by? So I guess I started thinking about it a few years ago. Um, and generally speaking, uh, the way that I work, the way that I write is a sort of scene comes into my head. And for me, it was the moment that a, a drunk girl is lying on the bed and a man's taking her underwear off and sort of telling her that she's safe and really believes that she's safe. And she's saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then she just sits up and says, what are you doing? And that was a kind of, I suppose that was the mm, thing it all started from really was that moment. And I guess at the time I must've been thinking a lot about, you know, the way that, we live in our culture and the way that we seduce each other and what's acceptable and yeah and so I suppose that's it was all kind of bubbling away I guess I, I was I was lucky in that I'd met Lucky Chap which is Margot Robbie's production company um for a tv show that I was that I'd written uh, a few years before and I and I hadn't worked with them but I really really liked them and so after so I did a short, I wrote and directed a short that was at Sundance in 2018. And I, I sort of did that in order to, I suppose, prove or hopefully prove that I could do a feature, make a feature. And I went to them and I pitched them Promising Young Woman. And they were amazing and they um, bought it. And then when it was finished, we went out to finances and luckily lots of people wanted it and wonderful film nation ended up buying it. And then um, I guess uh, one of the things was I had Killing Eve and The Crown and Cinderella. So I, my schedule was impossible. And also I was about to have a baby quite imminently. So uh, we had this very, very, we had a kind of now or never moment. And I think that, in many ways really saved the movie and made it possible also because Carrie came on as a kind of exceptional genius, which kind of really gave everyone the confidence that it you know, could be made. And yeah, so it was, it was kind of lucky. It was very quick. I mean, I think by the time it was, you know, a couple of years turnaround really. My assistant tells me that you're interested in resuming med school. I left under unusual circumstances. Huh. You remember the accusations made against Alexander Monroe? I don't. He took a girl back to his room. I know that what I, who I really, really wanted for the role was someone who um, was in many ways like a surprising choice for a role like this. So certainly somebody who hadn't done a ton of um, action movies or thrillers or genre stuff. And, um, you know, in my wildest dreams, Carrie was top of my list. Um, and I'd worked with her. I, I was, um, one of my first jobs was I was um, Carrie's amazing agent, Tor Belfridge's assistant, age 18. So I, um, I emailed the script to Tor and said, look, do you think there's any way, any way that Carrie would consider it? And luckily for me, she did. <laughs> I met Emerald again, as, as Em said, we, we worked together on this episode of Trial and Retribution when we were both 18. I like to talk about that a lot. Um, <laughs> Emerald and I, we realized when we were filming, a couple of weeks into filming, we realized that we had been in a scene together in a TV show when we were both, it was like one of our first jobs. And I was a girl who got murdered. Uh, and and an emerald was this sort of nasty girl who had bitchy a bitchy friend. Bitchy friend. Bitchy <laughs> friend. <laughs> She's available. Um, and so um, we had a fight in a nightclub, and then I subsequently was murdered um, in the show. And Michael Fassbender was the detective in our 
you know, none of this that we had remembered. And so that was sort of thrilling. But apart from that, I hadn't seen Emerald um, since then. And then I, I met her at somebody's house just before Christmas and she was on her way to the Killing Eve rap party wearing these like amazing skin tight pleather trousers. Big time, PVC. <laughs> there was like a hole in them and you were like should i what do i do about the hole was yes that? thank you Harry. There, there was a hole in the crotch <laughs> but you were like oh i'll just i'll just wear them anyway so off you went to a party and um and then i yeah and then tor sent me the script yeah i guess in january and said um you know but gave me absolutely no preamble just said just read this and um, yeah, and then I read it and I just was completely, I just never read anything like it. And I knew pretty certainly that I wanted to do it, um, you know, straight off the back and, and having met Emerald a little bit and knowing, you know, her background a bit and her, but then when we sat down and met a couple of days later, we had coffee, like within a couple of days, about after five minutes, I said, oh, Tor gets really cross at me when I do this, but I just have to tell you, I really want to do this job and I just, <laughs> I'm doing it, let's, let's do it. Um, and it was then, actually so much cooler than that. It wasn't, it's you not. You had the script in your hand and you just put it on the table and you said, I'm in. <laughs> and then you said, oh fuck, I'm not allowed to say this at all. <laughs> <'cause I'm not laughs> what are you gonna do? Why do you guys have to ruin everything? We were kids. If I hear that one more time, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. I was hoping you'd feel differently by now. It's so lovely to read something and have no idea where it's going. And, you know, and you're wrong footed at every turn. And I love, you know, I just think there's a, there are a lot of films where you, that have huge merit and are great stories, but you just know where you're going, you know, and you know what it is and you feel comfortable and you're, and there's value to that. And like some of your favorite films are those kind of films where you're just in for the ride and you know, but with this, it just, it was a, it was a complete, I mean, roller coaster sounds so reductive, but it was just, just constantly, you had no idea. Every, every time you decided something about somebody, it was kind of ripped away from you and changed and, um, so it just felt very, um, yeah, very surprising and, and nerve wracking in quite a good way. Emerald, you were pregnant when you began production. How long was the shoot and at what point did you begin editing it? So the timeline was I gave birth three weeks after we finished Prince of Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was quite fun. That was quite spicy. And you know, it was, I was just amazingly lucky because I was working with lots of people who just, you know, it just was not an issue. It was a non-issue for everyone. Carrie has children. Lots of the producers have children and have worked the whole way up until their due date, you know. Um, so it was, I was never made to feel like it was unusual, which is extraordinary and a testament to all of the incredible producers. Um, and as for the edit, they were amazing. You know, I, I, um, took a few weeks off and then they moved the edit to the end of my road and we continued on from there. And it was, you know, it was quite grueling, but that's okay, isn't it? It's not very often you get to make a film. Emerald, can you sort of walk us through the visual language of the film? It just seemed like <laughs> such a lovely and deeply silly and funny metaphor. I think I wanted something that <laughs> like, it looked like, well, again, it's so spoilery, you can't really, you're always working on in this movie. I really wanted to kind of like work with and against and subverting all of those kind of like genre expectations we have. And, you know, this idea of the, the kind of pan up on her kind of walk of shame uh, with what appears to be blood all down her legs and all down her arm. And then she's eating a hot dog. And it just seemed like a, a pleasantly funny phallic <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> But, but in terms of visual language, I guess, I mean, I'd sent Carrie and all of the producers, everyone, uh, the, the mood board and my sort of playlist that I used to write it, um, because I really was keen to sort of explain to everyone, like, this is not, this isn't how this reads, isn't how it needs to feel. It needs to be kind of come hither. It needs to be sumptuous and beautiful and appealing. It needs to hide in plain sight and surprise you. And, 
Um, and I guess it sort of needs to feel like, the thing that I said a lot to people was like this, it needs to feel like you're on the great, you're the be on the best date of your life. Your heart's fluttering. You think it's, you know, this is gonna be it. And you go home to someone's apartment and it's beautiful and it's amazing. And suddenly you find out that the door's locked behind you and you just can't get out. And I think that's the kind of feeling I wanted to have in general. And, you know, wanted to make this, it, the, the movie feel kind of like, I think a lot of our lives feel, which is that they're kind of, they are beautiful and they are, horrific and it felt kind of quite true to my well mine and all of my friends and lives i suppose i think you should go but a second ago you were determined for me to stay you were pretty insistent actually i'm a nice guy are you i thought we had a connection i guess a connection okay what do i do for a living sorry maybe that one's too hard how old am I? How long have I lived in the city? What are my hobbies? What's my name? Whenever I, you know, play anyone, I'm, uh, I'm, I sort of have to first of all really empathize and understand them um, as much as I can, and I and I don't think big picture at all. Um, when I'm playing a character and and for her, um, it certainly felt like Emerald and I made lots of key decisions about what had happened and what her life was up until that point. And then those were the decisions that sort of guided the rest of um, the way that we did it. And um, and then all of these incredible actors coming in and, and changing things every day in a really good way. Um, but it was funny when we shot the sort of climactic scene, um, there's a sort of monologue in there um, that I, the a brilliant monologue that Emerald wrote. That I remember when I read that monologue, when I read the script, I my I, my heart was sort of racing, thinking, "Oh my gosh, if I get to do this!" Um, but I really felt in that moment a sort of much more a, a kind of more collective feeling of sort of outrage. It, it, just when we were shooting that one scene, I suddenly felt like, "Oh, this is actually." And I think it was a note that M gave me um, that led me in that direction of like, "This is." this isn't just about this, you know, you're allowed to feel a bit sort of, you're allowed to feel um, angry on behalf of lots of, um, it, it just in that moment, it, you know, not, not throughout at all. It was much more of a kind of just that character, but it just felt in that moment, like, gosh, so many people must be feeling this way about their loved one or themselves or the person they, you know, so it certainly fueled that moment. That's not to say that I have any understanding or in a real way of how that must feel because I don't, you know, and I and I and I have no idea how hard it must be to be a survivor or to be supporting someone who's a survivor. But in that moment, I felt very in solidarity with people who um, have been through anything like this, and that was really powerful because that doesn't usually. I'm usually so myopic when I'm filming, and it's just about that one person and whatever. But in that moment, because of the sort of direction that M kind of gave me, it felt like a bit bigger picture for a second. It's yeah. also, I think, it's such a different process, like, as you were saying, Kerry, really, it's such a different process because I, I think that for me, I very, have always been quite interested in morality tales and uh, what, certainly, you know, in terms of the way it was shot and, and that there are lots of things, there are lots of parts of it that it is a sort of, a kind of Greek, uh, almost kind of touching on Greek tragedies or the kind of biblical stories which which are you know Cassie as the avenging angel who comes and offers redemption or punishment and that is just all the film is about it's about redemption and punishment and what you choose and it's ultimately you know for me a film about forgiveness but, but that people only get forgiveness if they admit wrongdoing you know so many people and this is across the board about all sorts of things People want forgiveness. They don't want to be, you, you know, they, they they don't want to feel like they've been wronged, but they also don't want to address it. They don't want to apologize. They don't want to admit. And so for me, all, all that Cassie is doing, you know, and she's called Cassandra as a kind of nod to the sort of original mm -hmm. Cassandra. All she's doing is saying, no, 
And it's so hard. And so the whole purpose of the movie is to say, look how hard it is to say no. Look at these two paths in front of this promising young woman. One is just like skipping, you know, skipping through daisies and, you know, delicious, beautiful candy land. And mm -hmm. one is hard and lonely and bleak. And that's it. That's what it's like for people. Who who chooses the hard road? It's a really it's a horrible road to choose. And so, watching the movie, I think the audience, you know, it, it's something that you kind of have to you have to present to the audience to kind of show, because there are moments in the movie where we're frustrated with her and we want her to just do something else or do something another way or whatever it is. But but that's because that's what we're conditioned to think. We're conditioned to think, but just path of least resistance. And isn't it funny how frightening some, a character becomes, or particularly a woman becomes, when they say, actually, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm right. And so I'm gonna keep going, even when everyone else is bored, and even when everyone else is furious, and even I'm gonna keep going. And that, you know, without Carrie was impossible because Carrie is so exceptionally gifted that, really it was only her who could have given this sort of character that in my mind was, as you say, this kind of, you know, I don't know, sort of an allegorical person in, in lots of ways, you know, to just to make it completely and utterly real. What happened? I left under unusual circumstances. You remember what happened, right? Why I dropped out. I'm not the only one who didn't believe it. We get accusations like this all the time. In terms of writing things so they don't seem like overly didactic and sort of, um, I don't know, sort of just spout, just, what you really don't want is to the characters to just be a cipher of your own arguments, which is why it was really important for me, for Cassie to often do things that really we don't approve of or, or so, you know, that are difficult to swallow. And the, the people that, you know, that she talks to, if they're, if they're bad, they're articulate about it. Um, they're, they genuinely think that they're right. And I think, honestly, they're, she's going to talk to people about something very specific. So it's natural that they would talk about it. And I just, I don't know, I just sort of played the, play the conversation in my head, I guess. And it, I hope it doesn't feel too didactic. Um, you know, that's why I guess it's sort of like a, a journey movie or like a road movie of her going to kind of visit these different people in order to have that conversation. It might be difficult. It was just two people in a cafe. <laughs> <Having fun. laughs> well, actually, of course, occasionally that does happen. I think the great benefit of working with a director that you think is brilliant and can also really trust is that you basically hand yourself over. Um, and I really felt like that on this film. Um, and and I, and I think I've always felt it's kind of important to me to never really care what the audience think. Um, so I, you know, in that as long as I play the part truthfully, then, you know, the audience is I, I just, not within my power. Um, but I think importantly for the film, um, Emerald, well, I think a lot of it was about just telling the truth. You know, there's, a, there's these sort of tropes that we see in films where people do really badass things and then afterwards they sort of, um, you know, ride off into the sunset and celebration. And actually the truth of most of what Cassie does is that like, it wasn't great. She probably feels terrible. She's in a hole now, you know, questioning what's happening to her. Um, and I particularly after, you know, there's a scene, it's in the trailer, so I suppose it's not much of a spoiler, but where Cassie sort of loses her temper and smashes somebody's car up. Um, and instead of, you know, sort of gleefully throwing the, um, the crowbar to the ground and sort of walking off in you know uh, in her high heels she, you see she, the terror of what's come over her and what's allowed her to to do that thing because it's mad and could get her arrested and 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 all the things that you you do truthfully think so um i think a lot of it is in the writing but f certainly i felt like so comfortable to play and be directed and led by emerald and uh i think it was just there was such freedom that and a lot of the time em would be encouraging me to you know go further and further and i, and I felt like i could do all of that trusting her to sort of 
make the right decision because I don't think it was a straightforward thing. And I think it was also affected a lot by who was coming in. So Bo had a massive effect on, you know, the way those scenes played out and, and all the other people who were in for a day, you know, or less than a day. We had Molly Shannon for about two hours. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to go out with me? What? On a date. Seriously, I just spat in your coffee. Also, one of the main thing, jobs I felt I had on this was to say to, you know, all departments, ah, but this is the moment when this is what the audience is. This is, this is, this is what's happening, but this is what we're, this is the trope we're subverting, or this is what we have to think now here. But the thing about Carrie is, that is just not her um, in many ways, like she is just Cassie. So she's in the middle of all this. I kind of am the sort of monster, like building it all around her, but she is always Cassie. And that was such an important thing about, you know, casting it and about having someone as brilliant as her is that it means you can do all of those things because you have the consistency of, of this kind of line of truth and this like kind of line of someone's heart going through it. But, um, but yeah, it, it was, it was, it's a kind of delicate, um, it's a delicate thing trying to thread all of those things together. What do you think Promising Young Woman is trying to say about men? Look, I love men. I think they're absolutely, I think, I think they're true. Um, this, you know, not, it's not a movie, it, there's a reason why everyone in this, nobody comes out of this movie very well, actually. No, no single person, including Cassie. Um, you know, we're, talk, we're talking about something that isn't nice. So, uh, so I'm not, so this movie has no reason to be preoccupied necessarily with, you know, with the, the good deeds that we all do. Like that's another movie. I think obviously it's it's kind of a bitter pill to swallow, but that's I don't know. That's how that's how the kind of conversation starts, isn't it? And I think it's really important. Something that I really do believe is like you can only really you have to let go of you can only kind of make the thing that you think is the thing you wanted to make, and it's sort of not. Oh, I, it's not my, in a weird way, it's not for me to tell people what to think about it or if, you know, the film is unkind to people or not. I, I think I think the film is kind of universally both loving and, and pro-redemption and pro-forgiveness, but realistic about what, what you have to do to get those things. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely think, I think everyone comes out of it equally badly. This film is not supposed to be fanatical. This is this is a this is a this is a real genre revenge movie. It's all it is. We've seen this movie a billion times. It's not a new movie or a new trope. It's just okay. Well, like let's do you know what it, you know? I think let's just then be honest with it. And I think that's all it is. It's it's just the gen the the genre movie, but just. It's, it feels ickier because it maybe feels closer to home. You have to sort of sell, uh, you know, escalating rage for this character throughout the entire film. I wonder what was that like and does it cost you anything personally? No, it doesn't. I just think it's the best, the best stuff. I don't know. It doesn't, I don't ever feel, for a long time now, I haven't felt a sort of, I don't, it doesn't sort of, affect me, po the, the only thing I ever sit in the car on the way home and think is like, oh, I didn't do that very well. I should have done that better. Why didn't I do it like this? That sounded dodgy. This wasn't real. You know, all that kind of stuff. But, it, you know, it's this, it's that's the really rich, scrummy stuff that as an actor, you are so excited to do. It's the reason I, you know, work is the stuff like that. The um, So it all, you know, where there's like serious stuff that we tackle in the film and, but, you know, all of that stuff is the sort of, you know, trying to sort of really make that truthful and feel all of that's really inhabited is, is what you're aiming for. It's, so actually I always feel a kind of sense of gratitude, not, I just feel sort of like, that's my, that's, that's the whole 
sort of sweet spot. I was about to say that's the whole point of my life, but that sounds, but you know, that's sort of, that's my real uh, Nina in the seagull. That's my vocation. That's my, you know, that's my good, that's my sweet spot. So like, I find it all so, um, I just found the whole job like that just so rich because if it wasn't me collapsing in laughter at Bo Burnham or Jennifer Coolidge, it was getting to <laughs> these scenes that are just so rich and so well written and so crunchy and there's just so much to it. So it was like this constant wave of satisfaction of having worked with the best people, with the best material, with the best director, like that's just not normal. Um, so I found it, there was no cost. I felt like I gained huge amounts from the whole process.